Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandal and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up is directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back. Thank you for joining us for Speak Up, and I'm Kevin Avard, your host, and today I'm joined with Ghislaine uh, Brenton from uh, Redress of Grievance uh, Committee, petition number... What? 28. 28. Uh, Jason, thank you for joining us on Speak Up, and uh, I'm going to call you Gus, right? That's what, that's, we, that's what we all call you. Yes. All right. Well, welcome to the show, Speak Up. Um, I, I wanted you to come on the show because you were uh, petition number 28. Yes, I was. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about your petition. You were founded. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk a little bit about your experience with uh, the Redress of Grievance, uh, where it needs to go. What did you find, as, as far as the value with the Redress of Grievance Committee, and uh, about your findings? So you know, let's talk about your findings first. Okay. Uh, you, you came to us because you, you felt like you didn't get your uh, due process of law. That's correct, yeah. And, uh, and so you were getting nowhere with the government. The courts were mistreating you, obviously. And uh, you said, look, I've had it, so I'm, I'm going to my, my state rep. And what state rep uh, sponsored you, by the way? John Heichel. John Heichel. He's right. uh, my, my state rep in Goffstown. Yeah. Uh, Goffstown, New Hampshire. Yes, sir. So, John, and you uh, came before our committee, and, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of things that were brought up, and, and one of the, fa the, 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 the points was this whole lack of due process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I was, uh, I was arrested, and uh, basically the, I put a, a stain, not, a, not even a stain, a uh, cloud on an attorney's title to their property. Uh, and I was told to take that off by the courts, and I believed that my claim to uh, the money that she owed me was legitimate. And I told the court that because it involved title to real estate, because now there was a lien on the property, and because it involved uh, an amount over $1,500 that I had the right to a jury trial and that I was not going to just remove the lien. Now, we never got to find out if I was right or wrong because I was denied a jury trial. And uh, the judge gave me three days to remove the lien, four days. It was on a Wednesday. He told me by Monday morning, if the lien's not gone, um, you're going to come back and you're going to tell me why it's still there. Now, was the attorney a, a guardian ad litem? The attorney was a guardian ad litem who uh, had represented well, now you had a contract with this guardian ad litem. I had a contract. Uh, there were seven points to that contract. She had done three of them, and she had failed on four of the issues that she was supposed to. But she still wanted to be paid. Yes, she did. And so you said no. Well, I'm not no, laughing. It's just no. it's, there seems to be this common theme over and over and over again that these that the guardian ad litems don't apparently uh, have to abide by any type of rule. If, if you hire somebody to do the shingles on your house and you want dark shingles and you show up and they're bright red, what are you going to do? Right. You so know. you put a lien on her, on her property and yep. the judge said, hey, this, you're a bad boy, don't do it. You asked for a, a, a trial by jury? Yes, I did. And Well, I didn't ask for a trial by jury. I wasn't interested in going to court. I had a lien on her property. I had started common law foreclosure. And um, I was all set without the court. She went to the court asking the court to uh, get involved on her behalf because uh, she had checked with an attorney. She was an attorney, but she had checked with another attorney. And uh, he had told her that I was going to liquidate her, her house, her pension, everything that was, you know. And, uh, and, and she was begging for the court's help. And uh, the court told me to remove the lien by Monday morning. And if not, I was going to go to jail. And so they held a hearing that Monday morning, March 22nd of uh, 2004. And uh, when I got there, they arrested me before I even got into the court, the courthouse. 
and I was in the court building, but before I got into the, the room, they arrested me, brought me downstairs, and brought me back up later and uh, charged me with uh, witness tampering, saying that she was a witness in my case and that I was attacking her. And you did a year in jail because of that? I actually spent uh, two years in, uh, in jail, which is equivalent to, it's, it's only eight months per year because you get four months of good time. So yeah, I was in jail for a two-year term. And prior to that, there was no record? I've never had a record, no. Right. So uh, No misdemeanors, nothing. Was there a relationship with the court and her at, at, at the time, too? Was there well, she's an attorney. She's an officer of the court. Right. And she's been a guardian at Lightham for apparently a very, very long time. So she's, she's provided the courts with plenty of work to do. And in this whole process, there's children involved as well. You, yes, you were is. separated from your children. Yep. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, well, I have four daughters. And um, at the time, in 2004, I had not seen my two oldest daughters in two years. I had never been accused of anything whatsoever. Um, and there was no reason. My, Based upon? My oldest daughter uh, didn't want to see me and never really found out why. And uh, then um, my second daughter started coming to visit. Well, she was coming to the visits all the time, but she started staying home with her sister because she felt bad that she was alone for the weekend. And after about six or seven months of that, she stopped coming. Mm. And then uh, in 2007 or 2008, in uh, June or so, I uh, last saw my third daughter, and then my youngest daughter uh, last saw her in 2010, in January of 2010. And um, those, I had supervised visits for five years because. Uh, and you um, committed no crime that you didn't? No. You never abused the children? No, nope, never. It just seems to be this ongoing thing. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of money in, in the Title IV D, and I've heard people talk about that here. Um, there's a lot of money in Title IV B, which has, to, I believe, that has to do with uh, foster care, foster children. Right. So there's a lot of money involved. You have you have the courts that are making money. You have therapists making money. Um, guardian at litems. Guardian at litems. Most of the people that have been on your show, the redress petitioners, you know. I've been to their hearings. I've, I know these people. I've seen and you there. One thing, yeah, and one of the things we all have in common is, uh, it seems to be, uh, I haven't verified it with everybody, is, yeah, if they all make money on us. And typically what happens is you get accused of something. Turns out to, the, the accusations are relevant. doesn't really matter what it is because it usually just disappears within a week or two. But now we have a guardian at litem involved who recommends that just in case, we're going to have a therapist for the children. And you should get a therapist because, well, who knows? It, you know? it seems to be an industry. It's definitely an industry. Self-serving industry. industry right. And if everything pans out eight months later, you haven't seen your child in eight months, uh, if everything looks okay and we haven't found anything You've uh, been a good boy in this witch all. hunt, uh, then we're going to recommend a third therapist get involved for reunification counseling. And this seems to be the common thread for... Every guy that I've met who's gone through this yeah. and has fought for their kids. So it's happening to women, too. It does happen to women. Of course yeah. it does. And uh, you know, so, they're certainly not immune from the process. So one of the things that I, uh, it seems to be another common theme that you, know, you, you guys or, or people, they, they get processed, end up becoming experts almost in, in law. It, some it, it, some it, do. Not because you're, you're spending, you, you have to. And, Another thing that, that really seems to be a common theme as well is, is a lot of your pro se litigants. That, that seems to be the, the common thread. Mm -hmm. That money, pro se, uh, you're either self employed. Were you self employed? No, sir. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm a carpenter in Boston. So, anyway, these, these seem to be some of the common threads that, uh, that, that are a reoccurring uh, nightmare that, that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, now, again, you were founded, what, what, what were some of the other points you were founded on? You were well, the, the, the findings of the uh, redress committee were that I was denied uh, my speedy trial rights, I was denied the, assist the assistance of counsel, and I was given excessive bail. Now, considering... That was $50,000 cash. It was uh, $25,000 cash. Who was $50,000? That, uh, that was Nick Haas. That was Nick Haas, I believe. Yes, but that had to do with... Uh, 
that his bail condition was actually based on child support arrears, not, and they wanted to have the money to be applied to the child support arrears. He hadn't actually committed any crime. Right. But in, in, my, in my case, I was accused of, you know, through the grand jury, uh, I was accused of committing a crime. $25,000 was the cash bail. No bond was available to me. And that was because I had put a cloud on somebody's title. Uh, Which was legal. Well, the Secretary of State and the Register of Deeds both testified at my trial and told the, the jury that everything I had done was legal. It was all exactly correct. All the paperwork was correct. Um, now, you said jury, so you didn't eventually have a jury trial. I had a jury trial, and I, because I knew that my right to a speedy trial, my, my, my counsel was sitting right there during my arraignment, and he was not allowed to join me. So I was denied counsel. I was denied a speedy trial and given excessive bail. And uh, even at the arraignment, when they asked me, how do I plead, I told uh, Judge Lynn, who's now a Supreme Court judge, I told him, I'm not going to plead and confer jurisdiction to this court. And he slammed his hand down on the table and pretty much screamed at me, this court has jurisdiction. And you know, he had already denied me. Joe Olson and Dan McGonigal were both sitting behind me. They're my counsel. And he had denied me my counsel. So right then and there, I already knew. My, my rights have been violated. This is all going to get thrown out. I'm not going to give them jurisdiction by participating. And I never said another word through that entire process, not even at the trial. I think there was one time where uh, the judge asked, he was, he was making comments trying to get me involved in the hearing, and Mr. Breton, I see you smiling and, on, and this kind of stuff, to, because I wasn't speaking, I wasn't on the record, so it looked like it was an ex parte hearing. Right. And at one point in time, I, I let him know, I'm not the person you seek. You've got the wrong guy. Yeah, you, you had mentioned something about, uh, we had actually, uh, some, with the findings, there was also some recommendations. Yes, there was. You want to talk a little bit about those recommendations? Mm, I'd love to. I don't remember exactly Well, I know there was were. one of them where you, you're, you're to be ident your rights should be identified in the courts, I believe. That sua sponte, yeah. Sua sponte. What is sua sponte? Without notice, without uh, asking. Um, I forgot what, it, what the definition is, but if you are in court and you demand your rights sua sponte, then the judge is supposed to be looking out to make sure that your rights are not violated. And so if you fail to object to something, the judge has to stop the proceedings and say, Mr. Breton, do you realize that by not objecting, you are waiving this right to, to have a, an appeal on this issue later? And oh, I didn't know that. I object. <laughs> and, so that's, uh, a little good, that's a good term to, to be able to... It's, it's good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly a step forward. And, you know, there's, there's pro se litigants, which represent themselves, and then there's pro per litigants who show up as themselves. Right. And there's sui juris litigants, and there's, there's a whole variety. Now, you brought a book here. It's called The English Common Law in the Early American Colonies by Paul Samuel Ryan. Reich. I think it's Reich. Reich. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's pretty interesting. The, this is a. Uh, the reason you brought this was you're, you're learning a little bit more about common law. A lot of people are talking about common law. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between common law and, and regular law? Well, uh, this, guy, this is a book that was a thesis that was done, in, I think, in 1890, 1889. And he talked about the common law, how it evolved into the United States from, from England. Uh, what, what happened is the people in England left because they couldn't stand the system. They wanted out. They wanted a better way. Mm -hmm. They came here, established their own way of doing things, and some of that English common law was brought in. And the more they settled and become, became larger cities and towns, the more of that English common law was adopted, and mostly around the New Jersey, New York area. And the, the people who wanted to maintain what they already had established and, and stay out of that English system of law, which they found, found very oppressive, moved to New York and to Vermont and reestablished themselves there. And uh, they wanted to get away from the English common law. And uh, that book describes the battles that they had in, in establishing something other than the English common law. But the English common law was, it was uh, similar to what we call case law. And it wasn't written. Uh, per se, it was mostly 
Probably the best explanation I've heard is that the English common law was based on the maxims of law. So, for instance, if there is no injury, there is no claim. That's a maxim of law. So that was, you know, that's a written thing, but it wasn't written as far as court decisions and not even case law. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really based on the maxims of law. So who practices common law nowadays? Well, I don't know. Um, Have we moved away from this? The, well, the common law uh, evolved into codes and statutes. It, it, was, uh, it was just a phase that uh, there was the Magna Carta and years and years of other things. And eventually uh, they, they settled here and wanted to have a, um, actually, let me, let me read one part of this to you to give you an idea of what they were trying to do. The ideas of the Massachusetts colonists on the matter of law appear very clearly from a resolve of the general court of the year 1636. The government is there entreated to make a draft of laws agreeable, quote, agreeable to the word of God, end quote, to be the fundamental laws of the commonwealth. Now, this is Massachusetts. In the meantime, until they draft these codes and statutes, in the meantime, the magistrates are to proceed in the courts to determine all cases, all causes, according to the laws then established, which is the early laws of the general court, and where there is no law, quote, then as near to the law of God as they can. So they, they were promoting uh, getting these codes and statutes written, but written in a way that only clarified what God's law said. And that's what the codes and statutes were supposed to be. And, but is, how close is that to establishing a religion? It's, uh, it's not, you're not establishing a religion. It was, uh, they were looking to take, they believed that the Bible was the purest form of law. And even atheists agree that the, the Bible is just and, and you know, justified, as far as how people treat each other. If you right. commit a crime and, you know, that kind of thing. As far as governing a population. And uh, so they believed that that was the best way to go. And so they wanted to get it all written out so that it didn't have all the lengthy stories of the Bible, I guess. Um, but they, basically they were saying, our constitution is the Bible and we want it written out. Now I know you brought a constitution, the New Hampshire constitution. You, did you want to share something with our viewers? Well, our constitution was ratified, it was accepted uh, by the people, I believe. Uh, by the people. Uh, I don't know if we ever voted on it, but uh, in, in eight, 1784, uh, about five years before the U.S. Constitution was uh, accepted by the people. But uh, the U.S. Constitution was never voted on by the people. It was a delegation of, of, of a, a group of members of delegates that had gotten together to take the Articles of Confederation from 11 years earlier and improve on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they weren't really supposed to come up with a constitution. They were supposed to just fine tune the Articles of Confederation. And next thing you know, we had a, we had a, a constitution. But that constitution was never voted on by the people in general. Uh, but it is by the laws that we live by today. It is. And uh, I don't know if our constitution was, but uh, I've read other constitutions, other state constitutions, and we have a really nice one. Yes, we do. I really, really like what we've got. So your experience with the Redress of Grievance Committee, uh, you had expectations. Yeah. What were your expectations? Well, when, I, uh, when my petition was accepted, I went to the Secretary of State's office, uh, not the office, the archives, and I started researching the, the petitions for redress. And uh, I actually held the 1703 petition. Back then, there was no Senate. So this petition had been presented to the governor and his council, mm. and I'm not sure who made the decision, but it had merit, so it was sent to the House. And on the back, when you flip it over, I don't know if that particular one had it, but there was a, typically there's a stamp of approval on the back of the petition that it was accepted, and whatever they were asking for. Uh, Josiah Sanborn, I believe, was in 1812. He had a petition that went to, um, at that time, after the Constitution, it was read before the joint uh, legislative body, and then they formed a joint subcommittee to investigate his petition, and uh, a recommendation was made to the 
Senate and the, the House, which they then voted on separately. And that's all, you can just, the documents are all there. So I was expecting the same thing. I was expecting to bring my petition in. And he was petitioning for a new hearing, actually, because he claimed fraud on the court. And there was a lot of other ones that were interesting, people who wanted a new fence and right. the militia had destroyed their fence <laughs> during their exercises. And it's, it, it has taken on a, a new, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's not like that, basically. The, but we do have, um, you do have the opportunity to, to petition the House. Uh, there, there are a lot of people that felt that we were, were toothless, if you will, as far as getting things accomplished. And I think because this is our first year of doing this, uh, it was, I don't know if it was more of an experiment uh, or, 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 or a place for growth. Mm -hmm. uh, what the people had to realize, number one, is they have a right. To, oh, absolutely. To petition yep. the House. Uh, I believe in the future, if it, if it has oversight uh, capabilities and they change it to Regents of Grievance or Oversight Committee, mm -hmm. it will probably gain some more teeth to it. Well, let me, let me, just, uh, let me just read this to you because it's, it, it is, it's very, like you said, it's very important that people realize they have these rights. But uh, Article 31 of the New Hampshire Bill of Rights, the legislature shall assemble for the redress of public grievances not the House Committee, not the Senate Committee. The legislature shall assemble for the redress of public grievances. So redress meaning a restoration. So I was going there looking for restoration. And then it continues on, and for making such laws as the public good may require. Mm -hmm. So they're supposed to get together, provide restoration to parties who have put in a redress, and then realizing what the flaw was in, in, in the laws, Add a law to correct, you know, whatever's going on at that time, to uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen to another party. Well, that is where th this committee can still uh, move forward with with your petition and with all the other petitions. Mm -hmm. But a legislature or a, a person will have to bring uh, a bill absolutely before the house. Yes, and that's that's kind of where it's all stalled out right now because. Yeah. It's almost taken two years to go through th at least 33 petitions at this mm -hmm. point. And, of course, we're in an election cycle right now, so it, it seems like everything has gone stagnant. We're in the, the, the recess period because, and actually, we have actually petition number five. Uh, even though he was founded, Mr. Johnson, uh, we are going to probably be hearing this Thursday uh, in a, uh, a special hearing, uh, the Rules Committee. Yeah. Uh, on his subpoena of, of documents, which were sealed, which he's never been able to view, why he's accused, why he's separated from yep. his child. Very familiar with that. And not allowed to fight against that, yep. which is a huge violation of your constitutional rights. You're, you're supposed to be able to face your accuser. Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment. And his liberties are taken away in Absolutely. that his right as a parent to, to parent his child. Yep. So we take your child away, you're not going to know why. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a second. If, you, if you're taking the child away because of a, of a real problem, if you've committed a, a crime against that child, by all means, prosecute. If you've abused that child in a way that is, that is very provable, then why are we just taking your child away and you're not in prison? Well, it's, you know, whether it's provable or not, uh, you're not the New Hampshire law clearly states that you're not to be denied uh, access to your children. Your children are not to be denied access to, to you without a fit parent hearing. Now, in, he's in never been, he's, he was never adjudicated as an unfit parent. I ever. don't know anyone who's had a fit parent hearing. Actually. I don't either. Exactly. I can't, I can't recall anyone ever saying that. And uh, so, you know, I have no problem with somebody saying, you can't see your kids until we figure this out. And then you schedule a hearing on Tuesday, right. Wednesday next week. But none of and, that happens. And we talk. There, there happens, nope. there just seems to be this, well, you're going to pay child support. In the meantime, we, we've taken your child away, and, and for whatever reason, mm -hmm. that's going to be only for the judge to see why, or the marital master. That's completely and based wrong. solely upon a guardian ad litem, and if that guardian ad litem is having a bad day, mm -hmm. you're in trouble. And now the, the Supreme Court has given them quasi-immunity so that the parents can't even come back at them. 
if, if they've misabused their or, or misrepresented the facts, or if they've scammed the system, if, if they've rooked you, if, you, if they've well, stolen from you. Many of these guardian ad litems do not have their own businesses. They're not fully, they don't, they don't stop to do this for the public good. This is their business. This right. is what they do pretty much full time. And they have an incentive. They have a very big incentive right. to not cause that case to terminate. And uh, there's a fee cap. And in every case I've heard of, the guardian ad litem motions the court to exceed the fee cap. Right. If I made a contract that I'm going to pay this much money for you to do this job, and you haven't done the job yet, and you want more money, and I, I object to that, why is it the court can give them the ability to continue to charge you? That's did that not happen part in of the your contract. case? Of course it did. Yeah. And, uh, it, and, you know, it seems to me if you're a prominence, so they, can, they can really rake in the dough. In the Vandenberg case, it was a, a $40,000, or mm -hmm. thirty-five to $40,000. And with the Dow case, Mr. Dow is a, is a factory worker. Uh, it, it just doesn't make what a doctor makes. Nope. $9,000. The cap is 1000 And yep. they were billing in advance. There's a problem with that. And, and uh, that it? was founded. Yep. So, uh, now, just, uh, just as a, you know, my, actually, you know what? Go ahead. Keep going. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Well, before we, uh, one of the things I'd really like to see is people get redress. And a lot of, I, this past week, I've been hearing a lot about impeaching a judge on, oh, I can't remember what it was, but it was circulating around the emails, and a lot of people don't realize you don't have to impeach a judge. They are here on a good behavior tenure, and as long as they behave well, they can keep their job. Well, what if a judge does not behave well? Oh, it was the thing with the, uh, the cops that walked into a store and took the jacket it had their patch on it or something like that, and the judge allowed the, uh, the police officer to, to, he dismissed the case, saying that, well, it wasn't really his intent to um, not, to, to keep that property forever. If you walk out of the store without paying for something, you pretty much have proven that you're not planning on bringing it back. Well, that judge misbehaved. That's not the laws of New Hampshire. And that's, that misbehavior is a violation of his good behavior. Well, who takes the judge out? Who says, Your Honor, you're out of here? The who? owner of that store, could, I believe, could take him to district court, sue him for bad behavior, get a settlement for the cost of the jacket, and thereby proving his bad behavior, remove him from the bench. What about immunity? There is no immunity for judges. As long as they sit on the bench and are, are acting in accordance to their... They have to act in accordance to the, to the law. And if they act in accordance to the law and cause you damage, even if the judge did everything right, in my case, for instance, okay, the judge did everything according to law. However, he did cause me damage. He caused my children damage with no just cause. It was legal, but it's certainly not lawful. So that's bad behavior. In my case, for instance, Judge Lynn, uh, Robert Lynn, was a, he was the Chief Justice of the Superior Court, and he... Uh, gave me bail conditions of $25,000 cash. The, my speedy trial had, had come due. It was time for, for them to have a show cause hearing so that the prosecutor could show why the trial should, should be held because my, I had already been violated. Joe Haas, one of the other petitioners, had brought it to Judge Lynn's attention. And uh, I'm sorry, he brought it up to the court's attention. And by the time he did that, Judge Lynn had asked the Supreme Court for help. And the Supreme Court had uh, assigned Judge uh, James Duggan to hear my case. So here's a Supreme Court judge coming back to Superior Court to hear a trial, to do a trial case. And Joe Haas brought it to his attention that they couldn't have the trial because of the uh, speedy trial violation. And he chose to ignore that. So uh, Judge Lynn and Judge Duggan both violated my, my right to have uh, assistance of counsel. They went past the speedy trial rights, and Judge Lynn violated my right to uh, reasonable bail. So here's two Supreme Court judges who obviously have acted in, you know, they've misbehaved. That's all it takes to remove a judge is misbehavior. They're here on good tenure. Well, who removes them, though? Is it, is it, the, the, is it the public? Is it, is it the court system? Is it the, is it the House? Is I don't it know. The... Somebody's going to have to come forward and <laughs> put a case through. Remove a few judges, right? Yeah. Well, we, we have seen some misbehavior on some judges where they've, uh, they've ruled outside Rules. It doesn't have to be criminal. Right. Okay, treason is supposed to be a criminal prosecution of the judge, yet there's no penalties. What's the penalty? Removal from office? 
Okay. Mm. The reason the reason treason is described in the in the Constitution, the United States Constitution, it says that the, the you know the the limitation when somebody is found to be to have committed treason is removal from office. That was a protection against the corrupt people in in the government to protect them from getting hung. Do you think we have anybody in our government guilty of treason? <laughs> I think there's tons of them. I think so too. Yeah. Uh, you you have a, a, a show that you you've been uh, a talk show as well. Yeah. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. I, uh, well, uh, Dwayne Moore, past, uh, Pastor Reverend, I'm not sure what his title is, but he's, uh, he preaches the gospel. He's in Pennsylvania, and we had uh, talked a few times about uh, an issue had that come. Bill Miller, uh, Marie Miller's son, she's a petitioner, mm -hmm. and Bill is uh, running for sheriff in, I believe it's Strat Stratham County, and uh, he, was, he got picked up. And there was some stuff going on, you know, uh, with him, and I was helping him out with that. And somebody else who knows Bill knew uh, Dwayne in Pennsylvania, so we had all gotten on a conference call, and, and we became friends by, you know, through this process of helping. What, what Bill. do you guys and, talk about? Well, we talk about law. We talk about constitutions. We talk about, you know, uh, sometimes somebody will call him up and, uh, and hey, I'm losing my house, you know. They don't have clear title. The judge, for instance, Marie Miller, we worked with her and, right. and other people. But people will call somebody and say, my friend's going through this, and we'll just all get together on a conference call with... Uh, have you helped anybody? We provide them with websites that we know of that do help people. Right. Um, I don't really have a... I'm a, I'm a carpenter. I'm, I don't have that kind of background information to be able how, to help How do people somebody. get in touch with that show or, or listen to it or, or tune into it? It's... Uh, um, Bibl Biblical Correctness Ministries, B-C-M-I-N, uh, .org, .com. I, I click my favorites and it goes right there. But uh, Dwayne Moore's, uh, it's, it's his show. And th they can get in touch with me, uh, yeah. either through you or... How, how did they get in touch with, with you? Um, hmm. I don't want to give out my email okay, or that's my fine. phone number. That's fine. Well, they, uh, they can get in touch with here at Speak Up. At, yeah. Or yeah. write Speak Up at 68 Bartimus Trail, uh, yeah. Nashua, New Hampshire, 03063. Uh, or Speak Up at nh at gmail.com, and we can forward that to you. That'd I, be great. I have your email. Yeah. Uh, I want to let you know that I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, there, there are still some more people that are, that are wanting to, to come before the Redress of Grievance. They want to get on the show. I know some people directly that are in fear of losing their children because they're afraid that if they say something, the guardian at litem or the marital master is going to be mad. Mm -hmm. And They don't make decisions based on fact. But that alone, and I, I could show the documentation that they're fearful. Of course they are. Uh, apparently one of these people happens to know Charlie Bass, and Charlie said, go on the show. And... Uh, People should not be afraid of speaking up. No. They should not be afraid. Whether you're a loony or, or you're, you're factual, yep. you, you have a right. And you, you, you have a right to speak up and, and, and tell your story. You know, Without the government saying, look, you're going to jail. or We're going to take your child away from you. Here's a, a great way to speak up. Okay? If you want to speak up, and I, and I really, really recommend that people do this, and... If you write an affidavit, okay, you, you take all the stuff that's happened to you and not the minute itty bitty details, just the, the really important things, not why it happened, just what happened. Just put the a, facts, ma'am, just the just, facts. Just the facts, put them in order in, a, in, in an affidavit format and then bring that to the house as part of your petition. You put the facts down because you guys, when I testified, you heard my story. I did not put in an affidavit in. I wanted to, but affidavits don't seem to be wanted very much, especially in the New Hampshire courts. A guy shows up with an affidavit. David Johnson put an affidavit in. He put five affidavits yep. into his case, right. and they spelled out five different issues. Those affidavits were never addressed by the opposing counsel, and the judge decided to go with whatever he felt like going with, regardless you, of those affidavits. You were there at the committee hearings. Yeah. When I brought up that, that David Johnson, I don't know if you were there at that particular one, but when I brought up the fact that David Johnson had, had, had affidavits, do you remember the oppositions to that? I, yeah. Well, 
What are affidavits? They mean nothing. They're, 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 they lie all the time. They don't mean anything. That, that was their, their, right. their, their yeah. response. Unless, unless they want to hold you accountable. Then it means everything. But I'm scratching my, my head. I'm looking at these people. I'm thinking, wait a minute. Do you, do you understand that this guy is holding himself in, in, in lieu of perjury and, and can be totally uh, ruined if he's lying? He signed an affidavit. He brought it to the court. And he's putting himself there out on the line. Well, that means nothing. OK. All right. So that was the mentality of the Democrats on the other side. They, they did not care. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm baffled by that. Well, they, these people came for help, whether it was you mm -hmm. or any other. And it doesn't mean we have to believe you. There, there were at least five petitions that, that were at least thrown out. One guy was absolutely lying. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally think I that guy that. should have gone to jail for lying. Well, you he's know, not it, under the penalties of perjury. But he should have. He didn't give you guys an he, affidavit. That's right. That's right, he didn't. However, he made a mockery. And I didn't. I, I'm, I'm, Attorneys you know, go and testify before committees all the time. I watch them take up three hours of my time while I'm waiting to put in my two cents. And they lie, and nobody holds them accountable. Yeah, that, that may be, yeah, that would be interesting to be able to do well, something Well, you know what? I, I, I've had this conversation with, with many state reps, and I completely believe you know, that, that you would save a tremendous amount of time in any committee hearings if government employees, because they, they're specialized in, in the field that they're about to testify on, they know what they're talking about. They have access to all the information, yeah. and I believe they should only be allowed to testify by affidavit under the pains and penalties of perjury. Yeah, I, I know in the Ginsburg case, and, and, and uh, where if you're going to accuse a, uh, an attorney of lying, mm -hmm. you have to have uh, evidence that is uh, clear and convincing to even bring, you have to have clear and convincing evidence to accuse yes. so that they can try that person on clear and convincing evidence to mm -hmm. the PCC. And then I'm not really sure what the penalties are. I, it, it, there, there wasn't, it wasn't clear if, uh, if it's a slap on the hand or. There aren't any. Yeah. So. That being said, uh, Speak Up uh, is, uh, is, is here for the people. Redress of Grievance is here for the people, and we want to get this, this going. Uh, there'll be a, a time when you can be, buy T-shirts and, and, and get the message out about uh, Speak Up or come to our website, speakupnh, uh, here at uh, dot com. If you have a, a, a problem, if you have an issue, it doesn't have to be with the family courts. If it could be with any part of government or if you, you see cronyism going on or corruption going on, uh, if you have a problem with your management company at, the, at uh, your, your condo development and you see corruption going on there, call us, email us here at speakupnh uh, at gmail.com and we'll get your story out. We want to be here for you. We are local, but we are also national as well. We're getting the message out and uh, we want you to be part of that. We want you to feel as though you have a voice. And that's why we're here. And Gus, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. And uh, until well, next pleasure. week, thank you very much. Every day, citizens around the country are faced with new dilemmas. Dilemmas that affect them profoundly. Whether it's injustice, discrimination, falling through the cracks, scandals and cronyism, balances of power, ethics, religious freedom, state versus citizens, and unfunded mandates, and the list goes on and on and on. Welcome to Speak Up. It's directed at those who have fallen through the cracks, and it gives them a voice. It's your turn to speak up, to stand up and fight back.